friends welcome back so today I'm going to do something out of the norm for this channel because all I do is usually watch a movie and then I share my re first time reaction for a movie that I've never seen and then also my commentary afterwards but for today because the last movie that I watched was a bridge too far from 1977 a movie that I truly loved it was an awesome movie and it was a real movie that was done in the 70s so much effort gone to it and it was about a real situation during World War II and some of my patrons or my patrons suggested that I have a look at this documentary that was done by this YouTube channel called History Buffs and just for, for me to learn so I thought while I watch it why do not I share it here as well it's because I have not seen this one before and I do not think that I've watched history buff channel as you know I have not watched many movies hence the reason for this channel where I am actually discovering a lot of movies myself I have this keen interest in watching and watching a lot of documentary about real life events it does not have to be just world war ii it can be like various topics that i love to watch if i have a free time that is what i like to do and there's an awesome thing about youtube as well there are some awesome creators that who actually spend a lot of time a lot of effort and awesome content about real world events they gather things that's real journalism at, in one point actually which I really respect so I have no idea about the history of channel so this will be my first uh, documentary from them and I look forward to watching it I do not know whether you have had the opportunity to watch it yourself as well hopefully it will be something that you may there will be something that you may learn as well out of this so they had done this whole documentary called uh, bridge too far by them maybe it's the making of the movie and then the real event as well so what i may do is while i watch the documentary i will maybe post here and there and share a thought if i have to hopefully not to interrupt the whole experience as always if you like this video do not forget to give it a thumbs up and if you have not subscribed to the channel please consider doing so as well and you can find a whole lot of full-length reactions and a lot more video content or at my patreon page as well links of which you can find down below so without further ado let's join to see a bridge too far by history buffs Hello and welcome history buffs. My name is Nick Hodges and today I'll finally be covering my favorite World War II movie, A Bridge Too Far. Based mm. on the book A Bridge Too Far by the groundbreaking historian Cornelius Ryan, this is the story of Operation Market Garden, a military offensive by the Allied armies to effectively end the war by Christmas by dropping nearly 40,000 airborne troops into occupied Holland. Their mission is to capture several bridges to open up an invasion of Germany. It was the largest airborne drop in history that ended in stunning defeat with 17,000 allied lives lost. Ooh, How 17, and why it happened are explored in vivid detail. Unlike your typical war movies, we don't follow the actions of one group of soldiers, but the efforts of many. Americans, British, Germans, Poles and Dutch. They were portrayed by one of the biggest cast of Hollywood actors you have ever seen. Yes. Most of whom are based on the real people who took part in this operation. Having said that, this is not a film that's going to appeal to your average moviegoing audience, but it is one that hardcore history buffs will love. This three-hour monster goes out of its way to be as historically accurate as possible and boasts some of the best battle sequences to be put on screen. All of which are carried out by practical effects of truly epic yeah, proportions. That's crazy. Almost everything you see was shot for real. Its achievements easily join the ranks of other classics like Tora 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 and Waterloo. Yet, as we all know, no historical film can be perfect. Even one such as this has its fair share of inaccuracies and creative changes. But even as I go pointing them out in this episode, you will still see that the filmmakers wanted to get this story right. And compared to other war movies today, we may never see its like again. This is a bridge too far. So I've never watched Tora 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 and Waterloo. Maybe something to look out for actually. 
So the movie begins in late 1944 with the Germans on the run. The Allied invasion of France inflicted on the Wehrmacht 725,000 losses, along with 600 of their tanks and much of their equipment. The situation on the Russian front looks even worse, with Germany losing 900,000 men that very summer, with Army Group Center being completely destroyed. This ferocious onslaught from two fronts had many believing that Germany was on the brink of defeat, which emboldened the Allies as they swept through France and Belgium. But their swift advance soon began to slow to a crawl. They were stretched thin and their supplies still needed to be trucked up from the Normandy beaches, as well as the south of France. Not wanting to outrun the logistical support, they waited to be resupplied. This abrupt pause lost the Allied armies the momentum they had in pursuing the Germans. So in September 1944, British Field Marshal Montgomery proposed a bold plan to Supreme Headquarters on retaking the initiative. It was called Operation Market Garden, and the idea was to drop Allied airborne troops into occupied Holland to seize and hold seven major bridges over Dutch rivers and canals up to the Lower Rhine. The American 101st would take the sector north of Eindhoven, the American 82nd would take the sector up to Nijmegen, and the British 1st Airborne and the 1st Polish Para Brigade would take Arnhem, the furthest corner of the market objectives. Meanwhile, the British 8th, 12th and 30 Tank Corps would punch through the German lines with 30 Corps advancing along the only highway that connected the Netherlands to Belgium for the offensive. They were expected to make 63 miles in two days. As military operations that is go, insanity, this was certainly yeah. an ambitious one. Way too ambitious as it turned out to be, as all the planning and logistics was rushed together in just a week. Where it suggested any earlier in the war, that this plan might have been killed at its inception. But the euphoria and their recent string of victories had resulted in overconfidence to sweep through the Allied leadership unchecked, with many believing Germany would collapse before the end of 1944. Now these weren't naive or gullible people, this was just the general thinking at the time. And Monty's plan could not only potentially end the war sooner, but also incorporated using the first Allied Airborne Army, which had been formed as recently as August 1944. Vast sums of money had been spent in training and equipping these men, but cancel drop after cancel drop kept many of them sitting on the sidelines, and political pressure was mounting to use them before the end of the war. So on September 10th, 1944, Eisenhower gave Market Garden the green light. Now, if you've already seen A Bridge Too Far, you probably noticed that Monty isn't in the movie, and the overall blame for Market Garden seems to be placed on British General Boy Browning, as if the filmmakers were covering up for Monty, this iconic British war hero, but there's actually a good reason for why he's not there. And that's because he kind of wasn't. Despite being the mastermind behind Market Garden, he didn't even involve himself with directing it. Around this time, his right-hand man, Francis D. Gigant, had to be sent home on sick leave from the Allied HQ in France. Monty, inexcusably, had no one to take his place that he felt he could trust. So Monty had to stay at his main headquarters to fill in for him. And as a result, he lost touch with what was going on in his absence. Little details like the RAF refusing to drop British Paris by the Arnhem Bridges or anywhere close to them. The reason why was because there was a German airfield nearby with anti-aircraft guns and the RAF were more concerned with protecting their planes than ensuring the success of the mission. Understandable, but it put the Paris in a tough spot of where exactly they were going to land. My problem is I don't just need drop zones. I need drop zones I can hold and defend. I understand, sir. But we really think we've found the right place. Well, where the hell is it? Well, yeah, it's not actually on <laughs> not this in the map. Uh, photograph, but <laughs> it should be. Excuse me, sir. It would be uh, out here, I think. This put the drop zone under eight miles from the Arnhem Bridges, which has received criticism over the years as paratroopers are ideally dropped as close to their target as possible. However, I don't think it would have made any difference if they had been dropped right on top of Arnhem. That far behind German lines was unrealistically ambitious, and there were just too many variables for things to go wrong. If any one group fails, it's total failure for us all. That's another thing. This whole plan hinged on the fact that the Allies expected to meet little to no resistance from the Germans. The general consensus of opinion is that our opposition will consist entirely of Hitler youth or old men on bicycles. Which just wasn't true. General Browning was told as much by the Dutch underground, who reported that two SS Panzer divisions were resting and refitting in Arnhem. But he refused to accept it, even when he was shown photographs of hidden tanks in the woods. And that's because neither Browning or anyone else wanted to be the ones that rocked the boat. Yeah, I'm sorry to in stop it there because I just wanted to highlight even for me while watching the movie I I involuntarily started 
disliking Brownings more and more because he was trying to please Monty throughout. And he mentioned that this operation was trying to happen 16 times it was put off. And I wonder what kind of uh, feedback actually was given by Mo Mon Montgomery at that point. But it's really fascinating to hear that he was actually not in the picture. So when whenever Browning say I was on to Monte, it must be just a call. So wherever he's from, he actually doesn't meet him. And then just out of this uh, seniority, the, because Montgomery being the field marshal, then uh, General Browning's must be like feeling compelled and obliged really to um, run this show. And he was definitely given enough evidence that there is sufficient, um, again, evidence that this whole mission may fail but they still went ahead just because they were worried to rock the boat. But I actually felt like at the very end only I realized, actually I, I realized this while editing the video, um, I heard at the very end when Roy was talking to uh, Brownings that he said, well, I always thought we went a bridge too far when he was asking about how he felt about this whole mission because Monty was proud and pleased, he said, right? Then Roy was asking, what do you think, actually? Then he said, I always, you you know, Roy, I always thought we went a bridge too far. So he actually was not on board with it, but for the sake of this whole Montgomery's plan, he actually was the stooge who played for it, and Montgomery was nowhere to be seen in throughout this whole scene. It's just it's quite bizarre actually, really bizarre because this is one of the biggest missions that ever happened during the World War II with the Allied forces and then 17,000 lives lost. Somebody may say, yeah, for the amount of lives lost throughout the World War II and the lives that were lost from the Russian front and also from the German front and all, 17,000 may not be as big, but those lives could have been, that the loss of those lives could have been avoided if they actually pulled out for the 17th time as well. So it's, it's really interesting. I had no idea about it until I watched this one, that Montgomery was not in the scene at all. I actually did not think about it, why Montgomery is not in this movie, because I thought uh, they did not want to just include him it was just the whole setup, setting up of operation and the whole situation that was being shared. But it's very interesting to learn about it. Tell Montgomery or Eisenhower that this great plan they rushed together in a week had serious flaws. 16 consecutive drops have been cancelled in the last few months for one reason or another. Ah, there you go. But this time the party's on. And no one is going to call it off. This short sighted stubbornness would cost the Allies dearly. Lightly armed paratroopers people. are just no match against tanks, as Lieutenant Colonel John Frost Battalion found out in Arnhem during the battle. Against such heavy resistance, the only hope they had was to hold on long enough for 30 Corps to come in and rescue them, and they were expected to take two days to reach them. If they could pull that off, then Operation Market Garden might succeed. You're late, you're late, you bastard, but we'll forgive you! They are not coming, my dear. That is gracious of me, don't you? Take cover! Unfortunately, the British paratroopers learned that this was easier said than done. The mm. Allies had underestimated just how difficult 30 Corps' journey would be to get to Arnhem. As a country, the Netherlands is a very flat and wet place, making it a treacherous terrain for tanks and heavy vehicles. 30 Corps' movements were restricted along the only highway to Arnhem, and any tanks that went off-road got stuck in the mud. This naturally created a massive traffic jam that stretched for miles. Oftentimes, the highway was only wide enough to let one tank pass through, and the Germans took every opportunity to stop that from happening. From both sides of the road, they lay hidden and waited for the first few tanks to pass them by. Once they did, the Germans opened fire with everything they had. <laughs> time and time again, 30 course charge was stalled by these ambushes. Parked bumper to bumper, they could not advance until the disabled tanks 
were pushed off the road by an armored bulldozer. The fighting was so fierce along this route that it became known as Hell's Highway. For a journey that was supposed to make 63 miles in two days, they only made it to seven miles on the first. Overall, it was delays like this and underestimating their enemy that cost the Allies this important battle. But even as the smoke cleared and the dead were counted, Montgomery still refused to accept accountability. He doubled down and claimed the battle was 90% successful, saying anything other than what he was being told, which isn't surprising given how Operation Market Garden even started. Well, as you'll know, I've always thought that we tried to go a bridge too far. This there infamous quote that became the title of the book and of this very movie was believed to have been said by Browning to Monty on the 10th of September, 1944, the day Monty issued the directive for Operation Market Garden. Supposedly, Browning asked Monty, how long will it take the armor to reach us? Montgomery replied, two days, to which Browning said, we can hold it for four, but sir, I think we may be going a bridge too far. Referring, of course, to Arnhem. It's a great quote, but most likely not true. Although Cornelius Ryan, the author of the book, stated that it happened, there isn't any recording of Browning meeting or speaking to Montgomery that day, nor any other. Over the decades, subsequent historians agree that Browning was not personally briefed by Monty on Operation Market Garden at any point. And that's weird because high level military matters at Army Group level headquarters always get recorded somewhere. Reinforcing this possibility is the fact that Monty's 21st Army Group had no liaison staff with the brand new 1st Allied Airborne Army, which Browning was a core commander in. Now, there's a possible chance Montgomery himself said the bridge too far quote to a staff officer and other people had it somewhere down the line. The reason for this is that Monty knew himself that the deployment and logistical preparations were sloppy, but he didn't care. He was a man in a hurry, more focused on personal matters and was winging it by taking the Germans as broken. And by extension, so was Eisenhower by giving him the nod. The Wehrmacht were always quick to punish mistakes like that and duly did. Regardless of where the quote came from, it is now synonymous with an act of one's ambition overreaching their capability, as Monty did when he went a bridge too far. Inaccuracy too far. This is really unbelievable. So actually, if Mon Brownings never met Montgomery, that is really unbelievable. I mean, how lightly did they take? I know they all were fed up, tired at the end of the day. After five years, this war going on and going on. And it, yes, it was going Hitler's way. But to risk all your allied troops' lives is not the, the strategic way of doing it as well. Because you're, let's keep the soldiers' lives aside because that's what they definitely did. But those are your resources eventually to make a real strategical decision, strategic decision, and then to actually exercise this whole operation properly. If you are wasting those resources, I mean, your chances of winning lessens even greatly, right? And then... Okay, Montgomery, I know he was definitely competing with Patton and then which Eisenhower knew and Eisenhower adored both of, both of them, I believe. But then I had, I'm questioning why did Eisenhower even knowingly give the green light for this kind of an operation to Montgomery? Like, I do not know what Patton came up with, what kind of operations and suggestions and missions that he came up with for this whole situation. But that's it's insane, right? When you think about it, like some an operation of this grand scale gets a green light when you really know deep in down in your heart this is not going to go well. It doesn't really add up. <laughs> So now that you have a rough idea of the colossal blunder that was Operation Market Garden, we can go ahead with what you're really interested in. What exactly did the filmmakers get right? Well, like I said before, no historical film is perfect. Even a classic like A Bridge Too Far has more than its fair share of inaccuracies. So what I'm going to do in this chapter is to point some of them out. Now that doesn't mean that they're all necessarily bad changes, it's just that some events and even people were changed slightly to condense some really complex history. 
For example, let's take a look at the fictional character Major Fuller, who clumsily shows General Browning recon photos of German tanks around Arnhem. Splendid view of the Dutch countryside. Can't see any tanks. Wait a moment, sorry. It, it, it's a lot clearer in the next picture. He's actually meant to be Major Brian Urquhart, but was renamed to avoid confusion with General Roy Urquhart. No relation. As an intelligence officer, Major Fuller's played up to be a shy and nervous individual who seems terrified in standing up to General Browning. I shouldn't worry about them. So, you see that they are tanks. I doubt if they're fully serviceable. In reality, Brian Urquhart was very confident in himself and his responsibilities. In fact, the reason why we know about him is because he kicked up such a fuss. I bet there were a lot of people who were too scared to speak up to Browning or Monty about why Operation Market Garden was such an awful plan. And in a way, they are represented through Major Fuller's character. Another thing that isn't true is when we see the Corps' medical officer send him home on sick leave under orders by Browning. I haven't done anything wrong. Of course not. You're just a little tired. The only thing that happened to Brian Urquhart was that he requested a transfer out of the airborne forces following the defeat. He became depressed after hearing about the high casualties and being unable to stop Market Garden from happening. Let's take a look at another example. According to the movie, one of the big reasons why the British first... But I think in that case, I like the fullest character. Uh, I understand why they actually changed it, uh, the Brian Urquhart, and because there was the same name that may be a bit confusing Urquhart in the, uh, the, in the movie. But I understand the requirement for this, um, like this fullest character. I thought it added a nice edge. And um, yeah, if we are talking about the accuracy of the situation, um, maybe that's the, the communication between Brownings and uh, Brian may have been different. But then anyway, he did not proceed to the, the operation himself. And then if he actually, if, like, like it said here, that he got depressed after the whole loss, I think Fuller's character does represent that because he was a very emotional person that way. But he did not want the troops to die like that. He definitely did not. So I think it was a fair representation of a fictional character in this movie. Defeated was because their radios didn't work. And that's kind of true, but not exactly. The tree-rich geography of the Netherlands did interfere with communications, as it also would have done in Sicily, Normandy, and southern France. The standard 22-set radio didn't have a range of 6 to 8 miles, and the wrong crystals and rundown batteries were installed in some of the radios. So you might be asking yourself, if the 22-set radio was so bad, then why did they bring it? Well, because there wasn't anything better. The thing is, portable radio technology back then were still primitive, so inadequate radios were to be expected. In fact, you could say these backpack radios were as reliable as the childhood walkie-talkies were. Fred Leader, what's your position? I'm touching his ass, I'm touching his ass, I'm touching his ass, I'm touching his ass, oh yeah. Mommy! I honestly think that people <laughs> have this misconception that? about World War II radios because of the rubbish that comes out of Hollywood. Like, honestly, there's a scene in the movie where Eagles Dare, where Richard Burton uses a backpack radio to call London from the Bavarian Alps. Broadsword calling Danny Boy. Broadsword calling Danny Boy. Over. Danny Boy calling Broadsword. Father McLean is waiting. Yeah, I'm calling bollocks on that. Anyway, the 22-set radio had worked before because paratroopers had always dropped within only a few miles of Allied ground forces. But on this occasion, Eight miles the market away. garden drop was dozens of miles behind enemy lines. Oh, so it? the problem with the radios wasn't so much faulty equipment as it was with general incompetence. They actually worked most of the time, six... but information had to be relayed back to Moorpark headquarters in London, and then over to Browning and Nijmegen, causing frustrating delays. That's basically the real reason why there were communication issues, but I'm sure that the director, Richard Attenborough, didn't feel it was necessary to give this more involved explanation. Another inaccuracy I think you guys will get a kick out of is this one. It's that bit in the movie where Anthony Hopkins' character, Lieutenant Colonel Frost, runs across the street from enemy gunfire. Imagine if I told you it would have been more accurate if his character walked across the street instead. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Hey, don't look at me. This is what the real John Frost told Anthony Hopkins when they were shooting that scene. John Frost said something the other day. I had to do a scene where I, was run I had to do, uh, run across the street and the gunfire. I was running fairly fast as I thought I 
would, you know, to get on the cover. And he did say to me, he said, uh, he said you know, <laughs> you're running too fast. I said, well, you, I'm running too fast. He said, yes. He said, um, you wouldn't run that fast. He said, you'd have to show the Germans and uh, your men a contempt for danger. I thought, ha-ha. Obviously, you can't show that because no audience is going to believe it. It sounds like something someone would make up to make themselves look cool, but it wasn't so with John Frost, because there's another moment in the movie where the scriptwriter, William Goldman, wants to give him a cool line to say, and John Frost put his foot down because he never actually said it. It's the scene where a German soldier walks across the bridge with a white flag and asks the British to surrender. Now, in real life, this conversation was with a captured British sergeant on parole who was sent by the Germans to demand surrender on their behalf. But this is basically how it went down. My general says there is no point in continuing this fighting. He is willing to discuss a surrender. We haven't the proper facilities to take you all prisoner. Sorry. What? I gave that line to Hopkins. Now, in point of fact, he didn't say it. Somebody else said it. And General Frost said, you have me saying that line, and if I say that line, everyone will know that I'm trying to make myself more than I was. And I said, would you mind being present when it was said? And he was quiet for a long time. And then he said, no, that would be fine. So we gave the line to somebody else. Oh. What I can confirm is that John Frost did say this when he was asked to surrender. Tell him to go to hell. Next up is not exactly an inaccuracy, <laughs> but an alteration to a certain character, the German field marshal, Walter Model, who's portrayed to be an exaggerated Prussian stereotype. He's shown to be unimaginative and a bit of a coward. There's one scene in the movie where he's having lunch at the Hotel Tafelberg, which just happens to be close to a British drop zone. British Fallschirmjäger sind anscheinend gelandet. Yes, I love this song. Drei Kilometer von hier. Warum sollten Sie das tun? Hier gibt es nichts Wertvolles. Ich, ich bin hier wertvoll. Sie sind alle nur gekommen, um mich gefangen zu nehmen. Holen Sie meinen Chauffeur und den Wagen. Although the scene is clearly played up for laughs, it is true that Motel thought the British were out to get him, as well as all the bridges. But honestly, it wasn't for an unfounded reason. The British were dropping in plain sight after all, and given his rank in the German army, it's understandable why he'd think he was a target. When he left, Motel kept in touch with HQ with his communication vehicles, unlike in the movie where he drops out of contact and the senior commander struggled to reach him. <laughs> Motel's also made to look incompetent in another scene inspired by real events. It's when a German soldier stumbles on a crash glider filled with dead paratroopers. For some reason, we see British paratroopers even though they were really American, don't ask me why. And the German finds plans detailing everything about Operation Market Garden. But when the plans are brought before Field Marshal Model, he simply dismisses them. Come, Sie, Ludwig. Wir wollen essen. Essen? What's wird aus diesem Plan? Dieser Plan? That's sowieso falsch. Okay, this is complete fiction right here. In real life, these plans were not only taken dead seriously, but wound up in front of none other than Colonel General Kurt Student, one of the world's great pioneers and foremost experts on airborne warfare. He quite literally wrote the book on it. In fact, the British and American Airborne were closely modeled on Student's own Fallschirmjäger, so he knew the real thing when he saw it. Student immediately grasped the Allied strategy and deployed his soldiers accordingly. Student's paratroopers are most famous for seizing the island of Crete, and he could see how effective they were in this fantastic documentary series called Apocalypse, the Second World War, and it covers all the biggest moments of that war in high quality color. Academy Drive. Now, whilst it's fun to learn about a film's inaccuracies, it's also important to recognize when they get it right. Despite what I said in the previous chapter, the director, Richard Attenborough, did try to make a bridge too far as historically accurate as possible. But ironically, when it was released in 1977, it was shunned by American critics, with some feeling that the movie was too unrealistic and referenced certain scenes they didn't believe were true. Like the one where James Kahn's character, Staff Sergeant Eddie Doan, finds his captain wounded but close to death. Seeking medical help, he drives like crazy through enemy lines and makes it to a field hospital. But instead of being treated, the doctor assumes the officer is dead and tells the sergeant just to drop him in a body pile outside. Well, if you don't look at him right now, he's gonna die. Dead now. Right now. 
I can give him a quick examination, do I? Thank you very much, sir. When some critics saw this scene, they dismissed it as pure Hollywood fiction, but it is mainly true. Apart from the bit with the German shooting him in the woods, the guy's real name was Staff Sergeant Charles Dewan, and he did force a doctor at gunpoint to save the life of Captain Legrand Johnson. Now, this is just one example, but it doesn't take much to see the lengths Richard Attenborough went through to try to be accurate, or at the very least, authentic. It's pretty obvious why he wanted to shoot a bridge too far in the Netherlands, is some of the real locations the battles took place. One thing's for sure, it certainly wasn't because it was cheap. A big problem during production was when the newspapers announced that A Bridge Too Far was going to be the most expensive film ever made, which it was at the time, the locals started hiking prices up for everything a film shoot might need. <laughs> when we go and try to buy a bag of cement or something, it's like, that's a hundred dollars. What? A bag of cement? Well, that's, if you've got 25 million bucks, you know. I mean, it, it was literally that. So sometimes <laughs> we had to go to Germany sometimes to buy stuff. Wow. You think that the Dutch would have wanted to support crazy. a Hollywood film based on their own history. But instead, the local businessmen sound so greedy it's almost cartoonish. We're shutting down production. Yeah, well, we only have a thousand dollars left anyway. Oh, there's a thousand dollar leaving town tax. As expensive as this <laughs> film came to be, it was certainly worth it in the end. What comes to mind the most is the fantastic airborne drop sequence. Alongside the Battle of Britain, this is the most epic real-life oh, air cinematography ever put on film. We really get a sense of what it must have been like to be a civilian on September 17th, 1944, to look up at the sky and see it filled with 4,676 aircraft, ranging from transport planes, gliders towed by bombers, and escorted by fighters. Just one indication of just how huge this armada was on the first day was that it took two hours of a non-stop solid stream of Allied planes flying overhead. And due to the scale and complexity of the drop sequence, they couldn't afford to do that many reshoots. So to capture as much footage as they could, they used 19 cameras in total, Whoa. including cameramen inside the planes who'll be jumping out of the paratroopers as well. You can't get more real than that. Seen it was seen. an enormous operation. You couldn't storyboard have. that. You didn't know what the wind would do. You didn't know where that parachute would go left or right. You didn't. So you had to have cameramen who, to all intents and purposes, had the expertise and the knowledge of documentary film cameramen. You had to have a guy who was prepared to put a camera on his shoulder and catch what he could catch as it happened. See, if we were it's doing brilliant. it now, you'd have three men drop and the, technically, though, you know, it all done for you. That was real. There wasn't a fake shot. There wasn't a fake shot in the movie. And also what's really cool is that this scene was shot in Holland as well, in the very skies that the real airborne drop took place. I mean, I'm sure he could have saved money if he shot it in England or someplace else, but Attenborough was insistent on using the real locations whenever he could. The reason why is because they can offer the actors the same challenges that the real soldiers went through, like the infamous river wall crossing. Wanting to be as accurate as possible, Attenborough not only wanted to shoot on the same river, he also wanted the same boats that the 82nd Airborne used. But when they arrived, he saw how flimsy they were and was a little worried for his actor's safety, which is understandable given how they were made of little more than plywood and canvas. What the? What'd you expect, destroyers? Come on, put it together! Fortunately, everything went fine with the actor's safety, which is great for the film because the way they're fumbling about trying to get these crappy boats to work is exactly what the paratroopers experienced. Once in deep water, the wall's strong current worked against them. They lost momentum, with some boats crazily spinning in circles. The reason for this was due to the lack of paddles made available to them. Each boat was supposed to have eight paddles at least, but many only arrived with two, which is absolutely disgraceful. So the only option they had was to use their rifle butts. If you don't have an oar, use your rifle butt! Anything! Row, row! There had been no time to give these soldiers any training with these boats, just a desperate dash to get over this big stretch of water. That's why they the say it's all the job training. eight to 10 miles per hour and it's 1,200 feet wide. On the other bank is 1,900 feet of flat land overlooked by a high dike road defended by the Germans. An incredibly daunting task. And the 82nd Airborne had to get there, all under intense artillery fire. And it was worse than you see in the movie as they were subjected to enfilade fire from the road and railway bridges 
as well as the opposite riverbank. Some men became so desperate to avoid the incoming shells that they rowed against each other. Spinning in circles, their boats were easy prey for the Germans. Desperate to maintain unit cohesion, Major Cook started praying out loud. Hail Mary, with grace. Hail Mary, with grace. Hail Mary. The purpose of this was to mainly keep his men in rhythm as they rowed. Hail Mary would be one stroke, full of grace would be the second stroke. And the inclusion of this historic detail built up the tension one of the most suspenseful scenes I have ever seen in a movie. It's so well done this scene, I can't praise it enough. This is an accurate portrayal of the incredibly courageous American assault. The only minor criticism I have is an altercation they left out of the movie because it makes the British look bad, and rightfully so. Basically, the reason why the 82nd Airborne needed to cross this river was so they could capture the Nijmegen Road and railway bridges and allow 30 Corps to pass through on their way to rescue the trapped British paratroopers in Arnhem. This joint effort would require the Americans to attack the bridge from one side and the British 30 Tank Corps to attack it from the other. However, the 82nd Airborne and the Germans knew that such a crossing was almost suicide. Wanting some assurances first, they asked a question to the 30 Tank Corps commander, British General Horrocks. General, if our men do it, if they take the bridge, what assurance do we have from you? Uh, that your tanks will go on to Arnhem. And that's when he made the statement, my troops will be lined up in force, hell-bent for Arnhem, and nothing will stop them. When this promise was made, the Americans fully committed themselves to taking that bridge, and the cost in doing so was high. Of the 240 sent to that first wave that weren't killed or wounded, only 99 remained. Still, the bridge was taken, and 30 Corps rolled through. The only slight deviation from the film was that the British tanks got across that bridge 45 minutes before Major Cook's Paris got to the northern end of it. But once on the other side, 30 Corps came to a halt a few miles later in the village of Lent. Much to the fury of the American paratroopers, and we see Major Cook confront the Grenadier Guards tank officer, Captain Carrington. Those are British troops at Arnhem. They're hurt bad. You're not gonna stop. Not now. I I'm sorry, we have our orders. We busted our asses getting here, half my men are killed, and you're just gonna stop and drink tea? We can't leave with tanks up that road. Jerry will pick us off like sitting ducks. Our infantry are still fighting in Nijmegen. When they get here, we'll move on. Now, whilst this confrontation really did happen, it wasn't as polite as you see in the film. Nor was it made your cook chew the guy out, but this man, Captain Burris. I can't repeat exactly word for word what I said to him, but I put my gun to his head and said, if you don't get this blank, blankety blank tank moving, I'm going to blow your head off. But with that, he ducked down in the tank, closed the hatch, and uh, it couldn't get to him. The sad truth is that even if the British kept their promise to the Americans, they still wouldn't have been able to rescue their fellow paratroopers in Arnhem. Around this time, Colonel Frost was forced to surrender his position at the Lower Rhine Bridge to the Germans and any hope of Market Garden succeeding ceased to be. Lastly, I also want to applaud a bridge too far for going that extra mile on their honest depiction of the Germans during the course of the battle, especially the Waffen SS. Despite their deservedly dark place in history, there were moments where some conducted themselves with the same code of honor and chivalry you would have found in the 1700s. Towards the end of the battle, all nine hospitals and casualty stations still in British hands were overflowing with wounded. Its medical staff worked around the clock trying to save lives all under intense artillery fire. Out of desperation, Dr. Graham Warwick appealed to the Germans' humanity and asked for a Was truce. Was it true? Forgive me, oh, but so there's a battle, and we are in the process of winning it. Cease fire. One hour, two. Just to evacuate our wounded. Afterwards, you can kill us as much as you want. The Germans were reluctant at first, but then General Beatrice appeared and agreed to a ceasefire. And just like you see in the film, he gave the British three hours to evacuate 1,200 of their wounded into German hospitals. He even went as far as to say he was sorry for the war between their two nations mm. and gave Dr. Warwick a bottle of brandy to take back to General Urquhart, which sounds very civilized. But once the three hours were up, it was game on again. That's the beauty of just keeping to your word. I mean, at the end, they are all humans, they themselves are the 
Now, I'd just like to add that no matter how disgusted we are with the atrocities the Waffen SS have committed, it would be wrong of us to deny that these events happened. Most films today would avoid the subject altogether for obvious reasons, which is why I love A Bridge Too Far so much. It had the courage and wisdom to respect that history is not all black and white. There are ugly smudges of grey between its pages that we all must look at with a critical eye, and to deny that is a disservice to the people who were actually there. Old Man's Guide to... Now, as much as I love A Bridge Too Far, there's one moment that does make my eyes roll, and it has to do with the scriptwriter, William Goldman. Now, I'm not suggesting he's terrible or anything. In fact, I applaud the man for his remarkable job in adapting the original book and being largely faithful to history. He definitely has my respect in that regard. However, he's a little bit full of himself. One of the things Goldman was especially proud of with A Bridge Too Far was the fact that he had set out to write an anti-war movie, a fact that he makes very clear in his interviews. It was a chance to say that war sucks, which most movies don't do. War is a terrible thing. People die. Lives are destroyed. People are maimed. And I just think glorifying war is a terrible thing. That's me personally. Now, obviously, there isn't any one of us who'll disagree with his opinion. As he puts it, war definitely sucks. The only thing I don't get is him suggesting that most movies don't say that. Well, what does he mean? Like, what kind of movies? Like, war movies? Because I can't think of a single one that is pro-war. Even the most gung-ho, over-the-top, flag-waving war movies don't glorify the acts of war itself. I mean, seriously, have you ever seen a Vietnam movie that made you think this? Charlie! War. It's fantastic. <laughs> okay, I think so. And yet, William Goldman would have us believe that anti war movies are something of a rarity. This wouldn't necessarily bother me if he was just a little bit more subtle in saying that war sucks. There's one scene that really stands out to me at the end of the movie. It's when all the principal Allied generals are atop the church spire and they're acknowledging their defeats and their interpretations on how it came about. Then Gene Hackman's character, General Sosabowski, says this stupid line Doesn't matter what it was. Yeah, One man says to another, I know what, let's do today, let's play the war game. Everybody dies. I can't express to you how much that line bugs me. It's a pure cop-out by William Goldman, and I'll tell you why. The thing is, generals can't afford such thinking because if they did, they never win. They wouldn't have the stomach to deal with death. They wouldn't be able to lead their soldiers confidently into battle or even gain the trust and respect. A perfect example why that is would be this idiot right here. Sir William Elphinstone. He oversaw what is on record as the most needless, catastrophic defeats in British imperial history. The retreat from Kabul in 1842. This was way back when Great Britain was trying to conquer Afghanistan. Elphinstone was a man who couldn't abide confrontations of any sort and compromised to the point of betraying his own side. When he was placed in command of a garrison in Afghanistan, the last thing he was looking for was a fight. Elphinstone positioned his compound miles away from the capital city of Kabul. Whilst this was more defensible, it did isolate himself and his troops from the local people who naturally looked at these foreign invaders with hostility and suspicion. Inside the massive compound, there didn't seem to be anything to worry about. The British lived a luxurious lifestyle with their wives and children. They had a race course, they played cricket, and danced in great balls. Their attitude was so relaxed, they might as well have been garrisoned in England. Anyway, this peace would soon end when the British government stopped paying subsidies to the local tribes. In anger, these tribes started attacking convoys around Kabul and the Khyber Pass. Elphinstone did nothing to stop these attacks, nor did he take any action against an uprising in Kabul. What he wanted was to retreat with his 4,500 troops and 12,000 civilians to another British garrison in Jalalabad. But to do that, it would take them through hostile tribal country. So Elphinstone reached out to the Afghan leaders to negotiate their safe passage. The Afghans agreed to meet for tea, but when the British envoy Sir William McNaughton arrived, they instead killed him and his party and dragged their bodies through the streets of Kabul. And what does Elphinstone do about this? Nothing. He just sends another guy over asking for the same deal, this time with an army escort. Anyway, the Afghan leaders agreed to grant them safe passage, on the condition that the British hand over most of their guns and cannons. Unbelievably, Elphinstone agreed to this. On January 6th, 1842, he withdrew from Kabul with 17,000 men, women and children. 
When the British column reached the narrow mountain pass of Kut Kabul, they were ambushed by the Afghans, using the same guns Elphinstone had given them. In the carnage that followed, the British army was virtually wiped out. Oh. This is what happens when generals refuse to play the war game. Anyway, I'm sorry for going off on that tangent, but I just wanted to illustrate the total absurdity of that line and what it implies. General Sosabowski wasn't anti-war, far from it. He was deeply affected by the Warsaw Uprising raging at that time and pleaded for his power brigade to be dropped into Warsaw to fight alongside his fellow Poles. He was just anti-Montgomery's plan for Operation Market Garden, a fact he made clear when he told Browning it was suicide. Now, he mm -hmm. actually demanded his orders in writing for Major General Urquhart and not General Browning, but still, the guts it took for him to say that it's a terrific example of a man willing to be true to himself and to his level of professionalism. When careers are at stake, most people buckle to the powers that be. He didn't. And he wasn't doing that because he thought everyone loses in war. It seems that in Goldman's mission to make an anti-war movie, he misunderstood what kind of a man Sosabowski was by having him say this lie. Everybody dies. Because when generals think like that, they often do. But to be fair, this is the only issue I have with the bridge too far. For the rest of it, William Goldman knocks it out of the park, along with Richard Attenborough, as well as the cast and crew who made this film with the same passion for history that we all share on this channel. If you've been salivating for another big budget war movie with nothing in it but practical effects and an attention to detail so well researched that it's almost like a documentary, then my fellow history buffs, look no further than a bridge too far. Friends, thank you so much for recommending this one to me. Not only I enjoyed it and agreed with a lot of things that he shared as well. I learned a lot from that documentary. Actually, it's really well done. And uh, I, I like how he actually showed the real scenarios of the World War II with this operation and what was happening and what was actually shown in the movie brilliantly done i agree with him 100 percent. the movie was fantastic really when uh, the 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 best thing was when i was editing the video for a bridge too far i edited it for the youtube as well as i have told you it take me a long time to edit a youtube video uh usually about 14 15 hours actually i enjoyed seeing the scenes again i noticed that I enjoyed the, hearing the dialogue, certain things, and it was brilliant. Seriously, it was a very well done movie. And I did not know about this Operation Market Garden as much as his rebuff channel did, just re revealed uh, about it. But definitely I knew the, how the effects were done. And like I said, I just can't imagine how, what kind of logistical uh, arrangements may have gone into this whole movie the setup it's it's amazing seriously they you need to have guts to do this kind of a project i know richard attenborough must have had such a backup for something like this and he is a um seasoned director but it's just amazing really amazing uh, movie and like, like I said, after having watched several of the World War II movies, actually watched three, I liked A Bridge Too Far because it had involvement of so many, um, so many of the powers that was involved, like the British, the Americans, the Dutch, the Germans, the Polish, and so on. So it's it's I, I think it really gave a bigger picture, and oh, man. The resources that were used is insane, really. But I love the History Buffs channel. Maybe I really should check out. As I told you, the only problem I have in my life these days is I do not have time, extra time in my hand. But I would love to watch some of his videos. I've never watched what else he has done. So maybe after making this video, I'll just go to his channel and check out what else is there. It's really interesting. So thank you so much for suggesting this one. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did as well. So until next time, I hope you have a lovely day and do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.